Hi there, my name is Ron Rogers. I'm a former Air Force pilot, and I would like to talk to you about a questionable decision to eject on part of one pilot. Now, as military pilots, we're given extensive training on ejection seat, ejection systems, and when you should possibly eject and the various considerations that might prompt an ejection. And considerations are such as, are you even in the ejection envelope? Uh, this event I'm going to talk about happened 40 years ago, and uh, at the time, the ejection seat capability of the T-38, which is the aircraft this ejection occurred out of, uh, was less capable than uh, the more modern versions of this aircraft. Uh, back then, you had to have 120 knots to uh, successfully, as a minimum airspeed, to successfully complete an ejection. And there are times where when you need to eject, that decision can present itself very rapidly. It usually is pretty obvious that the aircraft is about to very rapidly take you to your death. Things have gotten out of hand. It's uncontrollable. Things are just not going well. And usually the, the decision is not very difficult. I was once in a decision where I had my right hand on the stick and my left hand on the ejection handle deciding which was the better course of, of uh, uh, to proceed. I didn't eject in that situation uh, because the aircraft, uh, I was able to get the aircraft uh, back under control. Now this example has to do with a T-38 program for students back in the early 70s uh, when I was an instructor. We had a program, uh, it was called Dynamic Solo. It was later uh, renamed Dynamic Stupidity, but at the time it was a program called Dynamic Solo, and what you would do is you would take a student who would be going out in the T-38, otherwise on a solo flight, and to gain experience, because we'd had a cut back in flying time, they would put another solo student in the back seat simply to observe. Now at the time, uh, they didn't uh, specify the level of competency of the student in the front seat. And you could have students with various levels of competency. Some were better than others. Uh, after this incident, it was later adopted that only very good students could take a, a passenger in the back seat, which unfortunately meant that if you were a, a good student, that uh, your solo flights went away and became mostly dual flights, if you want to look at it that way, a flight at least with another person in the back seat. Now what happened in this situation is the student was doing touch and goes in a T-38, and he wasn't a very good student. And in the T-38, after you touch down, you uh, reselect the flaps, you put the aircraft into afterburner, and you raise the gear. And the aircraft accelerates very rapidly, so the gear is, um, has to be brought up pretty quickly after you become airborne. But the key here is power first, airborne, landing gear handle up. Now what happened in this situation is the pilot in the front seat reversed the process. He put the landing gear up, totally missed the airborne part, and then selected afterburner. And the aircraft, as the gear started to retract, the aircraft didn't have flying speed and it started to settle. Well, the student in the back seat was not very enthralled by this whole process and he had not been very impressed with the student's uh, touch and go so far. And when the aircraft started to settle, he decided, I have had enough, and he punched out. Now, as the student was going up under the seat, he remembered that he had not checked the airspeed. He had not determined if he had the minimum 120 knots to safely eject. And he's later telling this story in the, uh, the snack bar. And uh, smoking was a little more common back then. And he's holding a cigarette and he, he's trying to light it while his hand is shaking because he said, you know, as I was going up under the seat, I'm thinking to myself, I didn't check airspeed. I'm not sure if I had 120 knots. Now the T-38 typically land, would land at 155 knots plus a th one knot for every thousand pounds of fuel it had on board. And so you'd be touching down around 160, 165 knots. But of course you were in idle power and you were, get, you were doing the touch and go and you started to slow. So you could have easily slowed to a uh, lower airspeed 
then you would say feel you'd be able to eject from on the ground. This has been changed. Now the aircraft have zero, zero seats. But back then, you had to have 120 knots. So this soon was already kind of apprehensive. He didn't like what he was seeing, and he had had enough. The airplane was settling, so he punched out, and up he goes. Now, fortunately, the uh, he, he did apparently have enough airspeed. Uh, the seat separated. He got a parachute, and he comes down and lands. Well, the aircraft settles onto the gear and continues to slide. It goes sliding off the runway and comes to a stop in the dirt. Of course, this isn't a picture of the aircraft. I don't, unfortunately, have a picture of the aircraft back then. Uh, of course, the rear canopy would be gone. That's where the observer student was situated. That canopy is gone. And uh, as the wing commander described to the meeting of all the pilots on base, that the student stated that when he felt that he could run faster than the aircraft was sliding, he jettisoned the front canopy and stepped over the side and ran away. The aircraft was left sitting there in the dirt in full afterburner. The fire chief uh, came up to the aircraft and actually took both throttles, pulled them out of afterburner, and shut down the engines. Thank you for listening, and thank you for watching. If you like it, pre please press like and subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much.